We all can suffer from tension in the bodies that we store, whether it's in our neck or our shoulders, our back, our abdominal or in our legs. Everybody's got a story of that at some point. But have you ever stopped to really think about where that tension's come from? Well, this week, learn about the impact of the tension we store in our bodies and how, they may, how that tension comes from our past and just how to release it with Richmond Heath, the man who brought the trauma release exercise tremoring to Australia 10 years ago. Richmond talks about his own chronic pain and fatigue that resided in his body and how he was thrown out of a 10 day vinyasa meditation retreat when his body literally reawoke and began to start moving itself. This really was the beginning of his quest to understand more as to why this occurred. Richmond is a hugely energetic and entertaining man. I think this episode I asked the least amount of questions out of all the podcasts I've done because Richmond was just ready to tell stories. He provides a wonderful mixture of technical knowledge with real lived examples and stories. He goes super deep and vulnerable to provide some very real and personal insights as to how he's tracked the onset of physical patterns in his own body to past traumatic events and how he's overcome those impacts. Richmond also puts forward a fascinating concept of where our subconscious truly resides. This tool is a game changer. I've had experience of it myself over the past couple of months and I've found that it's just as powerful as talk based therapy when it comes to really dealing with issues. So this is well worth listening because you're going to learn a whole stack as well as be thoroughly entertained by Richmond like I was. So enjoy Richmond. Hello and welcome back to WA Real. I'm your host Bryn Edwards. Unlocking the stress, tension that's stored deep in the body by accessing a natural mammalian reflex, tremoring, is what we'll be exploring today with my guest, Richmond Heath. Richmond, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Now, you're not a WA local, are you? No, I'm from um, country Victoria. I was born in uh, East Melbourne on uh, Wurundjeri country, um, live in the Yarra Valley, and um, I've been coming to WA for probably the last four or five years to do TRE workshops. Um, but before that, uh, I first came to WA um, on a big on a reach out rural and regional tour called the Big Rort, which was it's amazing. You know, 15 years ago when we were promoting the internet for youth suicide prevention. And travelling around country WA at that point, we were putting in computers with internet access in youth centres because there was no internet. Yeah, it's only fifteen years ago. It's phenomenal. So I had a um, yeah a, a couple of months, so about six months travelling around WA, which completely loved it. And like a lot of people, you know, I would I love coming to Perth. I would love to live here if my family weren't all over in, on the east coast. Yeah, yeah. What is it you love about this place? Um, there's, a, there's a few things. The thing that stands out for me is space. So, uh, you know, p- people talk about this place has got a big sky. And like, um, you know, in, in the Yarra Valley where we live, the clouds are close, the atmosphere is close. And yeah. when I come here, it doesn't matter whether it's sunny or cloudy, it's like the sky is bigger. And that doesn't kind of make sense. Um, I love the lightness of it. I love the, the sea breeze. I love all the old buildings, the, the, the light sandstone, just the colour. It feels very light. It's, the sunlight is different. The water is different. The water's softer and smoother than over on, you know, down on the Great Ocean Road in Victoria. The water's like sharper. Um, sharp is the only way. It's colder and sharper, but it's not just the temperature. It's, it's um, yeah, it's just like sharper or something. And here the water's smoother. So it's just, you know, it's, it's just beautiful and spacious. Um, I completely love it. This this trip was the first time it's been rainy or wet uh, when I've ever come here. And, you know, still went for a run and a bit of a swim. And it, it's just, it's beautiful compared to Melbourne. It's, so it's, it's probably for me, it's when I come here, I feel my, my body and I just feel myself, I feel myself like expanding and relaxing, mm. but opening and just, it's, it's a very, very easy place to love. Hmm. That's pretty mm. cool. Mm. Um, so you, you're a trained physio. Yep. You deliver, you deliver education and workshops at TRE Tremoring. You've got a, also a background in Bowen's therapy and Pilates. There's a strong focus in your story on bodily and physical well-being where does that come from in the richmond journey yeah so look it's funny so when i was at school i did two maths two sciences like all my brothers and that you're meant to do 
Um, I did reasonably. I did okay. Then I went to uni. I didn't really want to... All I knew I wanted to do was play cricket. So I went to uni in order to go to college where my brothers went and to play cricket with the, with the Melbourne Uni cricket team. I did a year of arts where I went really, really well. So I did politics, anthropology, philosophy and stuff. And um, at the end of the first year, I can't really remember. I think I just thought, I'm not going to be able to get a job with an arts degree. So I put in two transfer into whatever. So I you know, went to the top of the list, the highest marks. So I went to like Melbourne Uni Medicine, Melbourne Uni Law, Melbourne Uni whatever, La Trobe Uni, blah, blah, blah. And then at the end of first year, I got an, an offer to go to physiotherapy. And um, I played heaps of sport. That was kind of probably my lifeline uh, yeah. growing up. And so I thought, oh, yeah, I'm interested in the body, so I'll, I'll do physio. So I started physio, but I also found very quickly that I wasn't really interested in the depth of scientific, uh, physiological, you know, information about the body. Like, I was fascinated about what muscles maybe moved my hands closer to my arm, you know, how that worked. But I really didn't care what they were called or the fine, the fine detail. Yeah. Um, so I struggled in a way to keep getting, getting through that. And it, I had a girlfriend who was doing physio as well. And she was just amazing. And it was her calling and her life passion. And she was brilliant. And it became really obvious to me that physio wasn't, you know, I'm like, oh, I was competent and I was okay, but it wasn't bringing me alive. And so mm. when I was at uni, I actually um, got a lot more interested in the mind and psychology. And in my fourth year... Uh, physio, we had to do an independent research study, and a friend of mine and I did something. We, it was called the, um, I don't know, the effect of attitudes and beliefs on chronic illness. So this is back in I don't know, nineteen ninety four. Right. Now, when we presented the information and these weird studies, stuff about you know people in a, in a hospital where people outside, you know, all random, all random and controlled, people were praying for these people, and the people who were being prayed for had half the level of medication and time in hospital. Um, you know, just extraordinary, ridiculous yeah. stuff. Now, when we presented that to the physio world, it was like, you've got two heads, what do you even talk about? We just want to know about muscles and movement. Mm. Um, and then a lot of that research turned up 15 years later in the films like What the Bleep, um, you know, What the Bleep yeah. Do We Know, One and The like Secret, top 10 those things. So it's fascinating because I then more, went more into a journey when I went to England um, straight after uni to, to travel, really. Yeah. So I worked in, um, back then there was a lot of physio jobs and... I remember calling the, the physio agency and saying, I want a job that's physio, that pays me really well like the physio because it was well paid, but it's the least physio job I can do. And they offered me, and they said, well, we've got a job in mental health. So I worked in, 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 at a hospital, Springfield Hospital in London in mental health as a physio, and I just loved it. Like, mm. And it was less physical. It was more about working with the psychology. I considered doing a psychology training, and they were, they were going to fund that. So I really went away from the body in a way. Yeah. But probably what happened to me was when I got to about 30, my body started to break down. Right. So I had in chronic way, yeah. I had chronic ankle pain, so I couldn't run anymore. Couldn't even swim because kicking my feet would hurt. Then mm. so because I couldn't run, I'd do swimming and then my shoulders packed it in. So I couldn't swim anymore. And I remember calling my brother at one point saying, "I can't do all the things I used to do to keep myself happy." Mm. which was basically sport and exercise. That was my whole whole thing. So my body was like slowly grinding down and I just couldn't, I couldn't keep avoiding my body basically. Um, again, I'd done, worked in suicide prevention, mental health. I'd done Aboriginal studies, worked in, in Aboriginal health and wellbeing. And so what really, cha- and then I started doing, uh, I did some meditation. And probably when I look back, the turning point for me was I did a, ten, a couple of 10-day Vipassana meditation. Yeah. So silent meditation where basically all you do is move your awareness through your body and feel sensations. And then on, on the third course I did, at some point when my conscious mind had kind of relaxed enough and I wasn't inhibiting my body, my body started to move, just started to sway. Very, very common experience. What do we all get told when that happens? The teachers say, sit still. Yes. So I had this little, you know, debate. I'm thinking, hang on, the teacher's telling me to sit still. Buddha's telling me to observe. I'm going to go with Buddha. So I snuck back in the hall at night, and as I put my awareness on one of my arms, it started to move and spiral around and stretch. Like it would stretch in one direction to like a, to a point that I could never physically stretch it that far, and then it would twist back the other way. And I was like, this is amazing. Now, in my little physio brain, I'm like, oh, this is a PNF pattern, a you know, neuro thing. Yeah, that's I don't even know yeah. what that says, but it's like this pattern of movement. So I'm going, oh, wow, it's doing this. So my ego is making sense of it. Mm. And then I thought, what happens if I put my awareness in both arms at the same time? And both arms started to move. It's like amazing. So it was like I was observing my arm, but my, my 
meditative process had taken away my ego that was would normally stop it. Mm. And then it's like, what happens if I put my uh, put my awareness in my legs, uh, my whole body? So basically, I'm in the hall at night, you know, ten thirty, everyone's in mm. bed, and my body is on it starts spinning me around the room, like just twisting and spinning, and. I went from before the start of that course, I couldn't lift my arms above my shoulder to a couple shoulders are because my shoulders are wrecked. Couldn't sit, couldn't sit cross-legged on the floor without 60 pillows and just intense pain to all, you know, a couple of days later, I could sit in loaded, half lotus position on concrete for two hours and, you know, there'd be a bit of pain and then it would subside, but my body would spin me around and I'll never forget that um, at some point it got me like into a handstand mm. with my feet against the wall for balancing on one hand, so one arm handstand, Whoa. and doing push-ups, and with ease. So everything I'd been taught about the body and the science of the body and strength and conditioning, it all just kind of went out the window. Mm. Um, and there was also, at the same time as my body started to move you know, almost infinitely, like it was just superhuman, extraordinary, um, my mind also did the same thing. So yes. my mind was like downloading stuff, which meant you know, my mind was moving like that. Now... At that time, I didn't have a context for it. My family didn't have a context for it. So I got kicked out of the meditation retreat. And there's lots of you other... Got kicked out. I got kicked out, basically, because, and there was lots of other layers yeah. about me challenging the authority because the teachers pulled me in. They're like, what are you doing? And I'm going, I'm just observing. And they're like, you will stop moving. I'm going, I can't stop moving. My heart's still pumping. You know, so it was, I was being a smart ass. Not that I was aware of it at the time. Yeah. And they're like, you know, stop meditating. I go, I can't stop meditating. You're right. It's like asking me to stop being aware or stop observing. Yeah. And then eventually the kind of penny dropped the, the teacher because I, I had this, at that point, because it was such a big challenge thing. So my breathing was like, <gasps> and he's like, why are you breathing like that? And I'm like, <gasps> because I can feel the fear in your, <gasps> you know, because I look crazy. And then at some point he said, stop breathing. And at that point, then all my breathing, everything relaxed. And it wasn't until many years later I looked back and go, oh, that was the point that in terms of our battle of authority, the power dynamic, he'd shot himself in the foot. So I'm like, well, you're a dickhead. You've just asked me to stop breathing. So I've won. Yeah. No, so I've won. Now, that wasn't, <coughs> that wasn't going through my mind at the time. Um, and then, so then when I went back to my family, they're just like, you've gone completely manic, you're completely crazy. And I'm going, no, no, this, you know, this all makes sense. And, and so for my look back mm. now, go, there was an element of going crazy. There was an element of mania, but there was also an element of, you know, truth, knowledge, wisdom, and learning. So that sense of a, of a, a spiritual emergence and a spiritual emergency. Mm. Um, I don't get a bit long-winded, but I was very lucky because in my Aboriginal Studies uh, course, there was a guy called Jack Beetson, who was the, the main teacher who I ended up working with. And I was starting to have all these mystical kind of experiences that in the Aboriginal cultural world made sense. You yes. know, like animals bringing messages or just these weird synchronistic um coincidences that in my you know christian catholic up scientific up background was just like all cynical bullshit anyway so i ended up going up to see jack beats and i was telling him all about it and um you know he was i'll never forget he was sucking on his plastic cigar a cigarette thing he was trying to give up and i told him i said look jack this is what's going on this is happening and this is happening and all these amazing weird stuff and then he kind of just took a drag on it. And I said, you know, you, you, this, you know, this is your culture. You know about this. And he just took this big, long drag on his cigarette thing. And then he said, he said, we all go through stuff like this at different times. Enjoy the ride. <laughs> now, I had my brother there who'd come up. And my other brothers had sent up all this, you know, psychiatric cat emergency numbers. Because they were like, okay, he's completely lost the plot. Which is partly true. But it gave me the permission to just go, it's all right. Just, you know, go on the ride. And so... My body was going to these extraordinary states. So I, you know, I started having things doing where, you know, I, I remember going to the beach, digging holes, like you see the Indian you know, people explore, digging holes, putting my head in the sand, covering the sand over and staying under the sand for an hour, you know, with this tiny little level, level of, of breath. So there was this kind of sense of this extraordinary, um, I don't know, you know, capacity in the body. Um, and another key, I, I will get back to the physio and the body, but another key story for me is when I was first rolling around that hall at night, and I'll never forget one time my body sort of took me up into a, a one-arm sort of shoulder stand, like it was all a lot of yoga poses, and a lot of the traditional yoga positions came out of what we would call neurogenic or spontaneous movement that's now being put into a, into a form. Anyway, so I was, up on one, I was up on one shoulder, my feet are up in the air, my eyes are closed, and my body's starting to tip over, 
looks, you know, it's like a, like a bit like a headstand. And it's almost, it's also at the point where I'm starting to think, shit, if I fall over here, I can break my neck. I could be paralyzed. There was a bit of fear. And then just as my body started to tip over, my toe touched something. Now I'd had my eyes closed for like half an hour, so I had no idea where I was in the room. And my toe touched something and then it moved back the other way. And in that moment, I had a sense of going, my God, my body knew that that was there. And I opened my eyes and it was like just a, a pot plant holder somewhere in the room. And it had just touched the edge of the edge of the thing. So mm. I started having to go, my body knows what it's doing. Yeah. I have no idea that that was there, but my body knew that was there. Um, it was a pretty crazy time in starting to follow and learning how to go, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let go and I mm. trust. And what would happen is there'd be like a pendulum where fear would come up. Yes. And then I'd go, hang on because I was coming out of the meditation state, I'd go, hang on, if I'm frightened of it, it hasn't happened yet. I've just lost presence. I've got into the future. So I'd come back to, I'm still alive, I'm breathing, I'd relax. And then the fear would dissipate and then I'd go into this state of you know, presence and my body would do something more and then the fear would, would go. So there was lots of um, you know, really life and death experiences. One time, I'll, I'll never forget this, I was lying down, face down in a massage table with my face in the hole so my belly's on the table and then my feet start to lift up off the ground and I go, my body moves up into a, um, basically like a reverse headstand. So my face is down, my body's straight up, vertical degrees, you know, my neck is at 90 degrees. So there'd be this experience of going, if I fall over from here, I will break my neck and die and paralyzed. But as soon as I'd have that thought, it's like, hang on, I've just lost presence. I'm not yeah. dead, come back to presence. And so I started to have this experience of my body um, when I kept getting out of the way, my body was knew what it was doing. It was not only was it just safe, or it was opening me up in extraordinary ways. Now, at that time, the way I described it, it was like I was flying. You know, it's like flying in the in the outer atmosphere in the skies. But I had one little bit of my toenail on the ground, so I had enough to know that if it really got bad, I could stop. Whereas everyone else is just saying, "Oh my God, you're totally crazy." You. You know, so the part of me, mm -hmm. the part of me that would normally run my life, it was like, it felt like, you know, they talk about ego death in a lot of sight. It was like that was just shrinking. And I had this sense of becoming, you know, feeling outside my own body, like I was, you know, expanding my awareness. And um, so as I was doing that, it was also that level of I was in a completely altered state. And then gradually over probably another six months, that sort of slowly dissipated. And then really the journey from there was, I mean, the big key learning there was my body had knowledge and wisdom that I'm mm. well beyond what I did. And when I got out of the way, my body could, wouldn't, it was like healing me. Yeah, it was healing me, it was moving me away. But at that time, I didn't have the capacity to maintain that when I came back into my normal sort of state. So over the next, I don't know, 15, 18 years or something since then, there's been this journey of the way I describe is like learning to fly, but with my feet on the ground. Mm. And the big sort of change for me, so I started coming, you know, back into the body. So here's a body that couldn't move, couldn't lift my arms above my shoulders, and all of a sudden, like, I'm just feeling like superhuman, amazing. Um, and then I was doing Bowen therapy for a few years, but the, the, the really big turning point for me was then when my, one of my mates gave me a DVD. He said, check this out, there's this tremoring stuff going on. Now I had no understanding that it was linked to spontaneous movement that I'd, I'd had in meditation. So I'd put the DVD in, um, did this tiny little tremor in my legs, it was like almost imperceptible. I went to sleep, didn't think much, in, much of it. I woke up the next morning and I was like, my God, what's just happened? I'd slept like I hadn't slept since I was a kid, like I was just dead to the world. Mm. And I'll never forget, when I used to get up in the mornings, I would sit with my um, feet on the ground, but my heels would lift up off the ground. You see a lot of teenage yeah. boys. It's like, I could put them down, but that's my tension pattern. And I'll never forget, I sat on the toilet, and my heels were flat on the ground, but they felt like they were a foot through the floor. So it's like my whole body of all that lifting up and that tension was just like, and in that moment, I was like, this has done something that everything else I've done, years of Pilates, years of treatments, years of it, this has done something extraordinary. Yes. Um, I had, didn't understand it, but I always said to people, so, so I knew what it did. It did this, whatever that was. I had no idea the mechanism. And so that began my journey of, I just happened to be in the right place. I was finishing up teaching Pilates. So I brought David Berselli, the TRE founder, out to Australia. And that began my journey of teaching TRE and sharing TRE, 
which originally started as trauma release exercises because that's what mm. he was in. He was working disaster many disaster zones in the third world. So he was seeing shakes and tremors purely through the lens of trauma release. Yes. So it was called trauma release exercises, TRE. Um, but over the years, for me, having you know, then I started to go, hang on, I had this experience of my body moving in for passion of meditation. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't just, I mean, it was partly about releasing trauma or healing the past, but it was also about growth and, you know, better performance in the body and the mind and all that sort of thing. And what TRE really did for me is it gave me a, a model where I could use the, this tremor reflex, we would call it. It's really about any spontaneous movement. And it's really not even, it's really not even that, like I like to say, people go, how do we turn the tremors on? And when I started, you said, we've got to invoke the tremors. Whereas now at my workshop in Perth on the weekend, I'm saying... Okay, if you're alive, you're vibrating. Your muscles, when you hold your arm out, you can't feel a shake or a tremor, but your muscles aren't static. They are contracting and relaxing, so they're already, quote, tremoring. They're yeah. already shaking. It's just so fine that we can't feel it. Hmm. So with the tremoring... Well, light bulbs are uh, constantly oscillating, but they oscillate at a point... So fast that you can't see it. It's just constant light. Correct. So that's already happening. And all we do, in a way, is with the tremor, you allow that to slow down <clears> and amplify. So then you go, oh, I'm not moving. Oh, now my body's moving on its own. It's mm. constantly moving on its own, but we're just not aware of it. Um, and so it's kind of happening all the time. And the more I teach it, the more I'm getting to the point of going, well, look, TRE is really just a framework and a way of kind of deliberately accessing more of what the body's... But really, it's about this, our body's alive. It's wise. It's got us to this point over millions and billions of years of evolution. My ego is, you know, 48 years old. My scientific intellect is, you know, so many years old and our mm. thing. And, um, and so Thierry gave me this model for that. But more importantly, probably, and we'll, we'll get into this, is it gave me a trauma-informed model of my body. Yes. Why was my body tight? Why was it rigid? Why was it breaking down? Because in my physio model, it was just because the muscles were tight. No one ever said, well, why have you got a tight muscle? What's making the muscle tight? We just looked at it, you know, as a very mechanical yes. physio model. Like it's because of the tight muscle, we've got to release the muscle. But it's fascinating. You know, every night when we go to sleep and you go through your REM and your non-REM cycles, your body goes completely relaxed. If we give you a general anaesthetic, all the tension patterns in your body are completely gone. So it's not like just a, it's not a mechanical tight muscle. And so, again, coming back to the body, what I look back now was that because my body was shutting down, to the point it, I couldn't keep living the way I'd always lived. I couldn't just keep using exercise and yeah. food and life and work to distract me. It had nothing to do with me. My body just grinded me down. It's just like, this can't keep going. You have to stop. Um, and so the beauty about TRE was giving me this model of the body informed model of stress and trauma rather than just the cognitive or the psychological yes. or the ego based stuff. And that's really what I <clears> love about it. It gave me a technique. And, and seriously, the first, when I started tremoring, when I look back now, the only thing I had in my life that could physically relax my body, so I had all the other techniques that we have where I could numb my body or distract my body, you know, like eating chocolate or, oh, you know. Okay, to us a day. Yeah, all those things. And the only other thing that I could physically relax my body when I was tense was basically ejaculating, you know, like having yes. sex or masturbating. Yeah. That would then physically release me, but it was also exhausting me. Yes. And then when I had tremoring, for the first time I had something where my nervous system could literally go, it's all tense, it's all tight, it's bound up, it's relaxed. So I had this other avenue to calm down and relax, which I'd never had um, in my life. And I also started to have an understanding of how traumatized I was. Yep. How traumatized we all are. And I and the thing for me around here is I never had a, <laughs> I never never had a capital T story. You know, I was like this tremoring is changing me. It's changing my life. It's amazing. But I wasn't sexually abused. I wasn't, you know, yeah, yeah, I didn't yeah. have any of that I story. About as a kid, That's right. I'm going just highly anxious, highly stressed, highly tense. And so it started to give me a, a body informed model of stress and trauma that moves beyond the trauma model and just talks about like immobility, tension, bracing, all the reasons why we contain ourselves, not in just a trauma state. Anytime we're containing our impulse to express ourselves, you know, maybe be creative. Mm. yell something out sing and dance in class at school whatever it is the muscular systems involved um and the and the you know our stress and trauma response is primarily about movement it's really what it comes down to but we're at the end of you know since freud onwards we're at the end of a, a long cycle where it's all gone into the intellect and the ego and the conscious mind mm. and, and those things are all real and valid they're all still there 
but we've forgotten the body. Yeah. And the body's the primary, the primary responder. And, you know, and we talk about the nervous system. Mm-hmm. And even now, as our if, as a our whole shower of electrical. Correct, and even now, as our as as our as psychology and psychiatry and that medical model moves into the nervous system, everything studies about the brain, mm. but we still don't include the muscular system. Um, and if you look at the latest research around fascia or connective tissue, they're saying the fascia or your connective tissue, all that white, you know, white adipose, seemingly irrelevant tissue in in the Western medical model, has a faster body wide communication system than the nervous system. Mm. So think about mm. this: a single cell amoeba in the ocean knows what to move towards if it wants to eat it or mate or whatever it does. They probably don't mate single cell things, or what to move away from if it's dangerous. Now it doesn't have an amygdala, it doesn't have a central nervous system. It's just got connective tissue. Um, and Bruce Lipton's book, if you haven't read it, um, the Biology of Belief, talks about you know the cell membrane, which is like the connective tissue and the knowledge and the wisdom here. So. With the TRE and the model, it's taking us back to go, hang on, we've got these bodies. We've got bodies before we've got a conscious mind or an intellect. You know, we're in utero, um, all that sort of stuff. And so it's about, in our Western world, you know, we've really split off our conscious mind from our physical body. Mm. We focus on the intellect. We get kids at school and we just sit still, think, learn that way. We don't have so much embodied cognition. And what's fascinating is that pattern in our western culture very much reflects on a macro level the same process that happens in our body in response to stress and trauma on an individual level where our, you know where our conscious mind will kind of separate and it's not so much our conscious mind does it the body withdraws itself so our conscious mind doesn't have to actually feel feel and heal or in be embodied in the experience so long story short but coming back so the TRA got me this understanding going, right, this is why my body's tight, is because my body is like chronically frozen, holding, numbing out, disconnecting as a survival response. Mm. It's not wrong or bad. And I can look back now and go, oh, there's all these reasons why it was like that. But for me, I was fortunate that my body got so broken down that I couldn't just keep living my normal life. Something had to change. And primarily what it was was about exploring the body, going back into the body and not... Critical for me is people who always say, oh, you're in your head too much. And I used to always say, well, why can't I stay in my head and go into my body? There was always the thing of you had to stop thinking to get into it. But so for me, it's about this sense of, you know, the body's primary, the body's responding. If it was all conscious, I say to people all the time in workshops, say, if we could consciously all just relax, we would choose it. We'd all choose to be enlightened in a moment, but we can't. So it's not up to our conscious mind. I mean, there are things we can do. Mm. So we have to work with the physiology of the body. And what it also did for me was, and this was incredibly relieving, is our whole self-help Western model basically is everything that's wrong in the world or with me is because of me, in terms of because of my ego, the way I think, the choices yeah. I make, the things I do, what I do. I've got, to, I've got. So it's up to my ego to change me yes. and everything. And one of the beautiful, and, and there's relevance, there's, there's, you know, yes, we can, we can do that. But for me, one of the relevant things is like when, when people are extremely traumatized, I'm not and sitting here, I'm not choosing to have tension in my body that mm. I don't need. It's not up to me. And the really, again, tying back into this sense of my body had this knowledge and wisdom. When I started tremoring, there's probably two big aha moments. When I started tremoring and got this model, what I discovered instead of, it having to be up to my conscious mind to fix my body because that's the physio model yeah you come and see me i have the knowledge i take responsibility i fix your body yes and then all of a sudden so I was like responsibility away from you so well as a physio yeah. so it takes it away from the client Correct. so the agency's now this is all mine i'm mm. the expert mm. great for business yes not necessarily good for healing and so in that model it's all up to my conscious mind my ego and if i don't know enough knowledge or i haven't got enough information or i'm not then i'm not good enough and the same thing in my own physical body. It's up to me to fix my shoulders. Oh, it's because of how I'm thinking. It's my belief system. It's, now, that those things are all relevant. Mm. But what I discovered and what everyone discovers, when I let go and I lie down and I surrender and I let my body move itself, it does amazing things and it moves me in the direction of healing and growth. So mm. I feel better. Less tension, more flow, more connection between my body and mind. So that first bigger hormone was, hang on, it's not up to my ego and my intellect and my identity, my conscious mind to create all these changes in my body. I've just got to get out of the way, which can be very, very difficult. And the more I did that, the more my body 
starts to move me. Nothing to do with me. It's this, this wisdom in the, in the body. And TRE is just one way of, you know, everything we do, every therapy we do, every practice we do ultimately yeah. is about letting the wisdom of the body reorganize itself. Yes. The second big um, aha moment for me then was, so this sense of like, right, when I get rid of my conscious mind and I let my body move, it, it heals. Not that that's how you live. I've still got to use my mind to live and make choices and do that. And it gave me more freedom to do that as my body is more relaxed. But the next big aha moment, because of the trauma-informed model, was that every time in life I was getting triggered, mm. every time I was going into defense, every time I got frightened, every time I got angry, every time I got shut down, frozen, collapsed, overwhelmed, blaming other people, because of Stephen Porges' polyvagal model, this sense of the way the nervous system responds to stress, a very simple question was, is my body under threat? And if my body's not under threat, what's under threat? Now, in the Western world that I live in, my body's almost never under threat in yep. terms of life or death thing. So it was often my sense of ego and identity. And if my body and my organism was shutting down, going into a uh, contracted state, and it was because of my ego, well, then that's an opportunity for me to go, gee, I need to get a bit more mature. If you don't like my shirt or my nose or my jumper or whatever I'm saying, what I'm saying yeah. I, I just, I need to grow up. And go, you're welcome to that opinion rather than, oh, why'd you say that? And having that response. You know, so it's like if people yeah. are pushing my buttons, then there's an opportunity for me to look at the button. So what it meant was instead of spending my life, and David Bercelli is very good, you know, very big about this sense of that trauma and stress is an evolutionary principle that helps us grow. In our culture, we avoid pain. We avoid suffering. Give me the medication. Give me the operation so I can just keep being who I am and avoid the pain and suffering, rather than going into that experience, going primarily in the body, and going through it and growing and learning from it. So what then I soon started to experience is I had a model where every time I was triggered, instead of blaming you, yeah. I had to look at what was happening in my body. Yeah. And so every time I was triggered was an opportunity to go, I've got an unresolved pattern here. And if I can then, now I've also got a mechanism to let that discharge and release, then instead of those triggers being something that I've got to organize the entire world so I never get triggered, it became an opportunity to go, right, I'm getting pruned. It hurts, it's painful, but the net result is something gets dropped away out of me, yeah. a false ego, and then there's a bit more blooming. So that's a, that. that's a very long-winded story. And, and the, so the two things was like, when I surrendered to my body, my body knew what it was doing. Yeah. And then the second, the biggest sort of thing for me is when I surrender my body and my life to the world or the universe or whatever and I would, I would put the parallels as that in religious people that's like I surrender my life to Jesus I surrender my life to Buddha I take refuge in Buddha in a neuroscientific model I go oh I'm just surrendering from my nervous system or the body and then when life is bringing me challenges as much as possible I'll still have all my habitual things of I don't want to do it I hate it I don't, that, all those reactions but they're all opportunities to look at what's happening in my body hmm. and then they're all opportunities for healing and growth Yes, that aren't being driven by me it's just life happens and all those buttons are getting pushed and they're all opportunities to get into a growth and a, a growth, a healing and growth state. And it's all happening in our bodies. Yeah. So that's, that's really the primary thing. The more I get out of my, not get out of my intellect, but use my intellect and my mind to experience, go along for the ride and just go, oh my God, I'm having this experience rather than going, it's up to my ego to direct everything. It's following the wisdom of the body. And you know, there are remarkable things when we do that, like that happened for me in Vipassana. Mm. There is just extraordinary knowledge and wisdom in, in the body. And when people do tremoring, same things happen. Body creates tension, the body uncreates tension. Nothing to do with ourselves. Anyway, so that's something to do with, you know, about the body. And I'm still, what I would say is I'm still, my habitual state is, you know, our defensive thing is to split off and go more into the intellect and get mm. really excited about the theory and the stories and all those things are great. And my sort of ongoing patterning is this learning to, and what I would say is rather than going, I have to go into my body, is falling back into my body. Yes. So it's not about going, oh, now it's another thing I have to do. I have to be more embodied. <clears throat> I have to consciously go into my body. But it's about letting that process naturally, you know, naturally happen because it's, you know, there's... As I say, amazing healing and growth. And um, you know, I remember, never forget David Berselli said, he said, the sad thing is most people are not having a great experience in their body. No. They're having pain, they're having suffering, and life is pain and suffering rather than going, my God, life is extraordinary. 
And there's this, you know, there's the dance like our in and out breath between we go into the suffering and then we come out into the joy and this pulsation in the physical body. Our hearts, our hearts pulsate, our breathing pulsates, our craniosacral fluids pulsate. Mm. In our culture, we try and avoid that pulsation. We try and avoid pain and suffering. We don't have the dark night of the soul. We don't let ourselves go into those painful experiences. We try to avoid being triggered. When we are triggered, I blame you for it. Don't do it again. Stop mm. doing that. Rather than just going, wow, look at this experience. Wow, I'm in a deep contracted phase at the moment. What's that feel like? And then what happens if you breathe out, your next breath is in. And allowing this natural pulsation, the way our body you know, vibrates or pulsates at all those different levels, but allowing that to start to come into my life. So there's moments of, you know, beautiful, great joy and like meeting you and I'm just like, oh, I just feel wonderful and alive. And then I'll go home and when I get home tonight, one of the kids will have left their shoes on the couch or whatever and I'll be cracking the shits and yeah. a little bit less than I was last time. Yeah. A little bit more embodied. Sometimes a little bit more because I'm more embodied and more aware of what's happening. So it's about this sense of surrendering into the natural rhythm of the pulsation in the body that we all experience, which gives great freedom to, you know, allow the happy, allow the sad, allow the pain, mm. allow the pleasure, allow the joy, allow the whatever. Anyway, that's a very long answer. I hope that's of some of some use or relevance. You might like to get a it's question awesome. in or say something here. No, it's awesome. So for the person who um, doesn't know... Yeah actually what tremoring is just yep. give me the super quick summary so super super quick summary is anytime you hold a muscle contraction and your muscles start to fatigue or they will start to shake so you could be at the gym you could have a weight and if you hold it the muscles start to shake or tremor yeah um, so in tre what we do is we just use muscle fatigue and the simplest form is people are lying on their backs with their knees out to the side. So we use the muscles on the inside of the groin, the adductors. You hold them there, and after 30 seconds or a minute, you'll feel a shaking. Mm -hmm. And instead of trying to suppress that or stop that, we actually just let it keep going. Yeah. And it's that simple. And, you know, if it, feels, if it doesn't feel good, you stop and take conscious control and stop it and go back to normal. But at its essence, it's as simple as that. Now, TRE uses a lying on the floor, using the adductors, and they're traditionally as a whole lead in exercises. But any position or anything you do, if you're at the gym, you know, and your arm starts to shake when you're holding a weight, it's not really about TRE. Your body's starting to tremor and move and do something. So you could do it that way. And the beauty about using tremoring or the exercises to access this natural, because it's a natural like recovery, resilience, releasing, um, reorganizing reflex is that we take it out of the psychological model not that that doesn't have its own validity but in this mm. state which means you don't have to think about something you don't have to recall something you just let the body do what it wants to do so it means it's not a necessarily a mental health practice even though it has huge mental health benefits and it means that anyone can learn how to this is the thing it's not really a modality all it's doing is connecting people back and going hey your body wants to heal it wants to move mm. it wants to let go of rigidity and tension it wants to come alive if it's been collapsed these are all the kind of nervous system again from our model the nervous system defense overwhelm trauma stress patterns so all we're really doing is going hey this this shaking is a positive thing this is life this is a, a, a releasing tension mechanism. It's a, a reorganizing the nervous system and the neuromuscular system to come alive. And for me, what I think is most beautiful is it's also about our conscious mind connecting with our body. Mm. And so the more the body moves, the more we become embodied, the more we come back into our body. And um, what's fascinating also for me is that in utero, and I didn't know this until a few years ago, there was a guy, Alan Fogel, wrote a book called The Psychophysiology of Self-Awareness, which is a very heavy scientific book, so I wouldn't recommend yeah. you read it unless you're into that sort not, of thing. Not a light read. Not a light read. But he talks <clears> about... <throat> so, again, people think about tearing and tremor, and we say, have you ever experienced shakes or tremors? And most people go, oh, maybe, maybe not, can't remember. What about public speaking? Oh, yeah, my hands shake. Mm. Yes, and then what we goes, oh, that's because I'm scared. And we go, right, well, if it's part of being scared, is it helping you to fight or flee? No. Is it helping you to freeze and immobilize? No, it's not part of being scared. It's the recovery. It's your body trying to cope with being scared and, and restore movement, blow off the steam, you know, dump mm. adrenaline. Because you're not fighting and you're not, you're not fleeing. Fighting. You're not fleeing and you're not freezing and immobilizing. It's, it's not part of our stress and trauma response. Whereas we would in our medical model, we'd go, oh, that's a symptom of PTSD. It's a symptom of anxiety. Or we'd go, it's a symptom you're out of control. We go, no, no, it's a symptom that your body's healing. Yes. It's coping. Yes, you are frightened, but this is the shaking is not part of that. It's the recovery part of it. Oh, I've lost track of what I was going to say now. And um, 
Yeah, I've completely, completely lost track. I must be warping. Well, you were on. giving me a summary level of TRE. Summary of TRE. Um, oh, okay. So, I don't know. So, animals, same thing. You see animals shaking. Yeah. We look at animals. Dogs. And, all, and we'll, all we do, all we've done in our Western medical model is we say, why are you shaking? Because you're scared and we stop there. Yeah. And we've just never studied it. And scared's said, a bad thing. Yeah, it's negative. Man and male. All that. Rather than going, hang on, what are the shakes and tremors actually trying to achieve for the body? Mm. And when you ask that question, it's like, oh, okay, that's something different. Yeah. And so, um, oh, now, now I recall. So this is where David Berselli was living in war zones. He was seen shaking and tremoring as a trauma release recovery because we shake. We don't shake in shock. We shake to come out of shock. Mm. If you come across someone on the side of the road after a car accident, don't get them to stop that shaking because that shaking is healing them. Yeah. It's like, wow, you're alive. You're shaking. Your body's only shaking when it's safe to do so. Let it happen. It's okay. It's cool. I love now, that when it's safe to do. It so. only will shake when it's safe to shake. So if you're there and you've got a, a saber-toothed tiger beside you and the shaking will stimulate it to attack you more, your body won't shake. So if yeah. you're shaking, you are safe. Yes. You already know you're safe. Whereas we tend to couple that experience of, oh my God, I'm out of control, my body's mm. out of control. Our body's that's always... interesting because if you're standing on a stage at a lectern about yep. to publicly speak, if you're that scared of publicly speaking and yep. you're shaking, it just demonstrates that standing there on a stage at a lectern yep. is not a saber-toothed tiger coming to get you. It is actually quite a safe environment. Very, your body's not under threat. Ego and identity's under threat, oh, shit, yeah. or feels like it's under threat. And of course, what do we do when that happens? We suppress it. Mm. Now, what that means is instead of the nervous <coughs> system calming down and down-regulating, it up-regulates. It goes into further defense, so I look calm, I pretend to be calm, but yeah. my body's now starting to hold tension. And You're with that, locking, it, and locking it, in. it in. It's like driving the car with the accelerator and the handbrake at the same time. Mm. And the ironic thing is when we go into those immobilization states, our cortex starts to shut down a little bit because it's an instinctual response. Mm. So then I can't actually give you as good a lecture. Mm. I can't think. I need to write my speech because I couldn't remember it or just well, talk. Focus creativity is everything's, everything's going down. Now, so that's the stress and trauma model. But one thing that I also love is that in utero, this is what Alan Fogel was saying, in utero, the body... From, from early conception, the body starts to shake and vibrate, the cells are vibrating, and say at 10 weeks you've got a body, you look like a little fetus, your arms and legs are starting and muscles are starting to twitch and contract. And what's fascinating is this has got nothing to do with the brain and the central nervous system. The tissues themselves start to contract and that twitching and that movement is how our central nervous system and our brain, not our conscious awareness, but just simply the nervous system, actually connects with the peripheral parts of our organism mm. and muscles but you know all that sort of stuff so it's through movement because if it doesn't move mm. the brain can't sense it just that part of the cortex goes offline because there's no movement so the point of this story is when we have a stress and trauma model around tremors then everyone comes because i've got trauma i want to get this is about releasing trauma which is partly true mm. when we have a model that said hey before you got traumatized shaking and tremoring was the way that your body became embodied, the way you became embodied that had nothing to do with stress and trauma, this is the most natural process in the world. This is about your organism getting more integrated, more connected to itself, your central nervous system, which then will grow into having a conscious mind in a cortex of getting more integrated and connected with your body. Now from that place, it uncouples the idea that shaking and tremoring has to be about trauma, it's going to be cathartic, it's going to be overwhelming. You get, this is the most natural thing in the world. Yes. Every single person on the planet has done this in utero for nine months. It doesn't have to have anything to do with trauma. And from that place, it helps us surrender and just go, hey, let's, let's let go. And the neuroscience of trauma is really useful in the West because our Western egos need a story to say yeah. this is okay. Yeah. And at my workshops on the weekend, I always uh, have this one in Perth. And it always gets to the point after I've done a day and a half of neuroscience lectures, that everyone's nodding their heads and go, at some point I'll get to the point of saying, now, this is all just a story. Correct. Because if you're a Christian and you believe that what's making you shake and vibrate is the spirit of Jesus or the Holy Spirit entering you, then all I've got to say is, this is, this is Jesus coming to your body. Let go and look how good it makes you feel. In the Western world, I say, oh, this is your, this is your nerve, you know, your brain, your amygdala, whatever. Is it? And then yeah, yeah, our yeah. ego says, this makes sense. I'm going to let it happen. Yeah. Or if you're in another culture, we might say, this is entities leaving you. Mm. We're going to so do that. So well, our neuroscience is really just a story because in a thousand years, 
they're going to be looking back at our evidence-based practice now going, you, what were you blokes thinking? You're in medieval knowledge yeah, here. you're were, making it hard work for What were you thinking? So what I love about the tremor <laughs> is once people are tremoring, I have you know two questions. Are you okay? Yes. And is it working for you? And everything else we do is simply about getting that ego to be able to, giving it something to chew. Oh, this makes sense. It's neurological. It's whatever. So the ego can mm. say, I'm going to let this happen. It's all it really comes down to. And as I say, we're all vibrating. Our muscles are all contracting and relaxing all the time anyway. So there's this amazing freedom of going, oh my God, it's not all up to me. Mm. I can let go. It's no different from, you know, spiritual spiritual um, traditions all around the world have, have been teaching for years and years and years. And there are cultures around the world. This is the thing. When David Berselli brought out his book, it was called The Revolutionary Trauma Release Exercises. In our Western scientific model, which is all about the intellect, knowledge, under, you know, the powers in the knowledge and all that, so that top-down approach, this is a revolution in the way we look at, you know, the agency is in you. It's in your body. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not doing it. I'm just teaching you. I'm just telling you what's already there. Yeah. I'm not putting anything into you. I'm you to focus in a lot. A lot. I just say, look in there. Your body wants to heal itself. Get out of the way and let itself heal. Hmm. Not very good for business. Not very good for the medical model. So there's a lot of resistance to that because it's putting the power back inside you. Mm. Same way in like religious, you know, in, in like if you look at Christianity, where my that was my family background, you know, if someone comes along and says, hey, you've got direct access to God, you don't have to go through the church. Of course, what does the church? is all battening down the hatches. Yeah. Same thing happens with our medical model. Now, it's not to deny the amazing stuff that our Western medical model does. We still want that and need that, but it's to open up the doorway to say, but hang on, people have got more capacity to heal and that healing is happening inside them mm. already as well. I mean, just to, just to stop and think about the power of that. Oh, it's, it's crazy. And it's, it's like phenomenal. It is, it's phenomenal. But what happens is we go, oh, I've got a sore neck that I need the chiropractor to do four sessions to treat. That's how I'm going to heal that. And then people come to the workshop. I had someone at the workshop on the weekend. Yeah, so they're, they're back. They go, oh my God, my back pain got sore. And then it went away. And then it got sore and it went, it went away. Yeah. And in a way, they're probably thinking, oh, it's not really working. I want it to go away. I'm saying, what's creating the back pain? Oh, are you choosing to do it? No. What's creating the back pain? Oh, your body's creating the back pain. Right. And then went away. What made it go away? Was that you? Did you choose? No. What made it? Oh, the body made it go away. Mm. Fascinating. So they're back into this pulsation. Go, hey, my body's creating these states. My body has the ability to unwind these states. Mm. Um, you know, it's great. Chronic pain research is now showing... We're saying you know, chronic pain after a couple of weeks or months is an output of the nervous system. Again, the physio model is you've got a bad back because there's a disc bulge. That's yeah. what's creating pushing on the nerves. Basically bullshit. Really what's happening is your body is going, danger, do not move. Pain is a great immobilization response. Yeah. And it's no different if I've been bitten by a black dog and I've got a fear about dogs. Someone brings me in a white puppy, f completely safe, and my body's freaking out. Oh, that, mm. I feel dangerous. So movement is one of the things that we, our body's most holding this fear of movement. And then, of course, when spontaneous movement starts to happen, the body starts to free up. It doesn't just about letting go of those. It's like, it's like rebooting your software. All those habitual software patterns start to drop away. So you're saying that it's the, <coughs> it's the body that, that makes almost the decision to constrict and then constrict movement. Or is it our mind making an executive so fantastic so it's just because there's two things there Abs absolutely and I can, and and I can yeah because like take for instance there's a guy called Ross Edgeley who just swam around Great Britain yeah and he put he, he had this he had this theory while he was so he's in the water swimming eight hours a day for yeah. like fucking hundred days or something like that um, phenomenal guy and he has this theory that he wanted to test while he was doing it and he, he I don't know where they got to the end of it, but he, he basically wondered whether fatigue was something that was created in the mind. So this is and that the body was infinite. Correct. So this is a so this is a this is a beautiful thing because you might have to erase everything I've said because it's probably all bullshit because it's part of the limitations of our model and our dualistic yeah. separate model. The point I try and make about it is going and so, so it should be clear our conscious mind. Yes. So we would say, are you consciously choosing to make that back pain? No. So there's some sort of there's some sort of split as well, if mm. you know what I mean. So 
you know, the way I like to think about this is Candace Pert, who wrote The Molecules of Emotion, was yes. a big, big breakthrough. I heard her on the radio once. I never knew whether she wrote this next book. She said, my, me- my next book is called Your Body is Your Subconscious Mind. Because, and this is all the stuff about embodied cognition. So the way I like to think about it is a bit like this. When you learn to ride a bike and you have to concentrate and consciously pay attention, and then that pattern sort of sinks down lower into your cortex so it's automatic. Mm. Same thing happens if my life, if my body is habitually <coughs> bracing in order to feel safe, that pattern kind of sinks down into my cortex so it's like, it's just there. It's yeah. just what, so think about it like this. If I put you on, your, on a bike, can I get you to unlearn how to balance? How would you unwind that pal- It's like, I can't unlearn that. Yeah. Same thing sort of happens with tension. That pattern of bracing and holding, if I could consciously do it, I'd just relax. Yeah. But I can't. So it's like in my body. So the body's holding. It, it, again, this is, it's, this is like the limitation of language. Let's call it my body or my subconscious mind or they're the same thing. Yeah. Whatever it is that's holding. And I can't access that consciously. So I need to access whatever it is that's not my conscious mind to allow it to let that go. So sometimes I'll, say, well, I'll call that your body. Yes. Whereas I like, you know, I love what you point out because we, we're separating in mind body. Well, I say, well, it's not really your body. It's really your subconscious mind. Yeah. Well, it's kind of really your ego, but it's not your ego in the Freudian sense. It's like your, it's, it's not your conscious ego. It's like your unconscious ego. We kind of get to the point where we catch the tail. And, and again, I just like to say, well, can you relax it? And if you can't, we don't, I don't, I don't, it's pointless arguing about whether it's the mind or the body or whatever. Yeah. Saying, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. Nothing. Can you do it? No. Okay, lie down, let your body tremor, see what happens. Shit, it started to let it go. Yeah. So the language of saying the body, you know, it could be the body slash the subconscious mind. Both, they're both the same thing. And, you know, another good, exam, a good example of the limitation of language is in TRE because it started very much focused on shaking. Yeah. What I like to refer to as spontaneous involuntary movement. But yes. it's very hard to say because it's not just about shaking. Someone might invoke the reflex or the, let the body move. By doing the knees and... Yeah, and doing whatever. Yeah. And the body goes into a really a long, slow stretch, which we would call, or you know, TRE would call, a fascial stretch because it's not just about a muscle shaking. It's about it's your the, whole... the white stuff. Yeah, the, the whole stuff is stretching and lengthening because mm. that's the latest and greatest thing. Everyone gets excited and has erections because it's all about fascia this and fascia that. <laughs> And as I like to say, you know, 200 years when we can measure your etheric mm. field, we'll be going, oh, it wasn't about the muscles. It wasn't about the fascia. It was all about your etheric field and yeah, your astral yeah. body. And we'll get excited about that. Your larger chakras. Yeah, well, exactly. So, and that's not to say any of those things aren't true, but your body doesn't give a shit. Correct. Your body's just going, I'm just going to do this because it works and it feels, and it feels good. Um, and then the other thing it's is... needed. Because it's needed. And it's not... A, it's, the body wants to do it. The, our, our organism and life seems to have an innate impulse to want to organize itself at more efficient and effective and better organ that's just life seems yeah, to be life and we just get in the way of it we get in the we get in the way of it so even when we talk about <laughs> tremoring kind of oh well, it is it's very humorous so even when we talk about tremoring so we have to have some language i can't just come and say right we're just going to go into experiencing whatever's happening in our body it's yeah. very hard to market that but if you say, oh, we're going to do tremoring, people yeah. are like, yeah, we do tremoring. We start with tremoring. And then we go, now, hang on. It's not just shaking. Your body might start to rock from side to side or it might twist. So what's the effect? Oh, afterwards, I feel more free. I feel more better. Great. Sometimes people afterwards go, oh, I feel more nervous. Great. You're coming out of freeze. Mm. We, we, we haven't put anything into your system. Like if, mm. you, if you tremor and then you feel a bit anxious, we would say, oh, the tremoring's made me anxious. I'll never forget David Berselli saying... It's like saying you're blaming the headache on the Panadol or you're going, the antivirus program on the computer, put the virus in there. The tremoring just shows us what's already in the system. We're not putting anything in you. If you do this and your body <coughs> creates anxiety, that's the pattern. It's mm. sad, but true. But when we understand the way the but nervous necessary. system... But necessary. Nece- it's, just, it's not unnecessary. It's like necessary pain, necessary suffering. Ne- mm. Because you're not under threat now. Your body's recreating it. It's like it's like freaking out at a fluffy, white, friendly puppy. This movement, this spontaneous reflex. Your body's healing mechanism. We're now freaking out because we're thinking it's taking us the wrong way. Partly because our medical model says, if you're anxious, whatever treatment we do must only move you in a linear direction towards less anxiety. Whereas in reality, when the body slash subconscious mind has been bracing and, and containing 
the movements, mm. the emotions, Protect, whatever it is, it. and protecting it, when the body starts to free up and move, we then go, hang on, this is moving us in the wrong direction. I'm meant yeah. to feel more calm. And I'll never forget, you know, after a couple of months of TRE, most people, what happens is they do it, they start to feel more calm. They love it. Beautiful. And then after a few months, not always, but after a few months, as our body starts to thaw out, we become aware of why we're bo- why was my body tense in the first place? Oh my mm. God, I've got all this anxiety. Mm. I'll never forget ringing up David Berselli or doing calling him up on Zoom or Skype or something. I'm like, David, this is bullshit. It doesn't work. I'm feeling worse. I'm feeling more anxious. <laughs> And all he does is he smiles, leans into the camera, and he's like, this is fantastic. What's going on in your body? And I was like, fuck you. I don't want to have to, you know, like, <laughs> I know it's true. It's yeah. brings, it's showing me something. It's like I'm thawing out. <clears throat> and part of thawing out is we often get more connected mm. to what's happening. Now, we don't have that model in our Western medical model mm. where we go, you know what? I can't remember the guy who said it, but someone said, you know, if you want to feel better, you have to get better at feeling first. So if your body's bracing and tense so you don't feel all that anxiety, so true. and that's what you know, all, the, all the books and where trauma therapy is getting to is this sense, you know, the body keeps the score, the body bears the burden, the body remembers, or the subconscious mind is holding those patterns because it's overwhelming for our conscious mind or my ego or my awareness to deal with it. As the body then starts to let go of those patterns, we may actually get more aware of why we were stressed, what, what, what that was containing. So we need to have a model that holds us and supports us and go, you know what, as my body thaws up, I'm going to get better, but I might feel a bit more pain or suffering necessary mm. to be able to integrate it. I like to refer, refer to it as like, you know, ongoing use of this reflex or the tremoring, whatever you want to call it, I describe it as like being pruned. So you, know, you think about being pruned. The first time the bush gets pruned, it's like, fuck, keep it away, it hurts, oh my God, you've cut that off. Six months later, it's like, shit, look at that flower. That flower's more amazing than the other flowers. Mm. The next time it happens, fuck, don't do it. Oh, it hurts. Hang on. But I, I seem to remember that somewhere along the line, this led to a beautiful flower. Yeah. Oh, fuck, no, don't do it. Oh, three months later, beautiful flower. And yeah. each time this process happens, as the pruning comes in, as it's we're getting like, triggered. Bring it on. It's, well, well what, I like, <laughs> what I like to say is I say, bring it on in really small, manageable, <laughs> non-painful, you know, tiny little bits that I can cope with, please. Mm. But there's that sense of we restore the pulsation. Wow, going into the pain, going into the body, going connecting to the body. The net result is, yeah, I might feel a bit more sometimes. And then I come out and it's better. And that's kind of the trauma recovery model of this pulsation, which is amazing. But... What I also like to say is we don't want to just focus on the trauma release model because then we go, oh, tremoring is all about trauma. You know, I always like to ask people, do you ever shake during sex or orgasm? Yeah, sure. Does that mean it's traumatic? Oh, my. And, you know, when I first <laughs> learnt TRE, because that was what I was being told, I'm, I'm looking at everything. It's like, you know, if, if all you've got to hammer, everything looks like a nail. I'm going, oh, my God, this must be something to do with it's traumatic to be open-hearted or yeah something like that rather than going no hang on this is life and vibration energy moving and it feels wonderful and it's pleasure so the more i keep doing it the more i uh let go of the not letting go as in dismissing it because if your body's shaking because you've just had a car accident or if your body's shaking and moving and there's terror and fear or rage well that's that's what's happening but often what's what's leading to that is if we've got that model then we we've always got to say if you just go hey mate you're in utero your body shakes and moves it feels good it's how your body grows it's how you heal forget about the stories if you need to feel anxiety you'll feel it if yeah. you don't you won't and I know I'm on the let me tell you one story because this is one of my favourite stories and critical so I'd been teaching Pilates for four or five years right before I did TRE so I had done a thousand million billion pelvic floor contractions I'd taught people about their pelvic floor all that sort of stuff And I'd had chronic back pain and chronic sciatic pain and all that sort of stuff. And teaching Pilates, I was strong and I could do everything, but my back still ached every day. After a couple of months of doing TRE, I'll never forget, I was standing in a workshop talking to someone and I just noticed that I felt tense. I didn't know where or how, I just thought, I feel tense. So I thought, hang on, I'll take a breath and relax. I took a breath. As I relaxed, I literally turned around and went, holy shit. Because as I breathed out and relaxed, it felt like my bum hit the floor, like my pelvic floor dropped. And in that moment, I was like, oh, my God, I've been squeezing my ass on for 35 years. Yeah. And I had no idea. Now, it's that... Switched on. It was time. just switched on the whole time. It's just like any... You know, you see a dog that's nervous and scared and traumatized, it's got its tail tucked under. Um, Bob Skay, the guy who wrote a brilliant book, again, very more medical-based, mm. um, called The Body... 
the body bears the burden. Body bears the burden. So he talked about his big paradigm shift from, he was a psychologist, he had psychology training, plus he was an orthopedic surgeon. And his big paradigm shift, which for me in my intellectual physio world, this was the, was the, the shift for me, was he told a story about a woman who'd come to him, um, people who had, she had piriformis syndrome. So, you know, chronic muscular pain in the across the buttock, you know, squeezing the sciatic nerve, all that. Now, in our normal medical model, that's because it's a tight muscle. So you see the physio, I will do, you know, tri- trigger point release, we'll treat it mechanically. Needle stuff like that. For some reason, he took a full history of this woman and, and she said, she turned out she'd been sexually abused. Something, he had an aha little light bulb moment. Yeah. The next 30 people who'd been referred to him for piriformis syndrome, this muscular sciatic pain, he took their history and every single one of them had been sexually abused. And so what he got, is went, hang on, why are those muscles tight? Now, it doesn't mean if you've got a tight piriformis, you've been sexually abused. What it means is you've got a tight piriformis, it means your body's in a defensive, contracted yes. state. So for me, I was like, my God, my bum's been squeezed on all the years. Now, I had no idea why. I had no concept. I had no story. I had no emotions. And so for the next period of months, as I kept tremoring, as my body was starting to downregulate, I would notice, I'd be like, oh my God, my bum's just squeezed. I didn't even know how that happened. And when it was squeezed, then I'd be able to relax. I was like, I don't know why I'm scared. I don't, I don't have a story. I don't feel any. But my body's responding. So if you go into the body, my ego's not aware of it. So if I just yeah. think about psychology and emotion, I'm going, no, no, I'm feeling fine. I've just got a <laughs> tight muscle because my muscles are tight. Yeah. Whereas when we look at the body first, we go, my God, my body's going into defensive contraction, squeezing, immobilizing. And then it wasn't until about, this is good because this is going to relate back to the thing that's hot off the press for me this morning. So then I kept watching this pattern and it was generally happening in, in groups, in social settings with people. And then I'll never forget one day I was going... For you. For me. Yeah. For me. That's right. For me. My bum was always on. It was always social yeah. settings with people. So of course my ego's like going, oh, what happened to me? Did someone do something? Did this, you know, what, blah, blah, blah. And then I was involved in a men's group uh, where we were organising this big event. And I'll never forget this day, we were going down to a committee meeting. Now, these are like six of my closest friends. These guys know everything about me. I've been being nude around them. Not no, like they're, I've got no secrets. I've yeah. got nothing. They're the most safe, friendly, loving, supportive men. Yeah. They're my brothers. So I was in the car with two of the other guys, and I'm just, I'm on fire. I'm having a great time. I'm so excited. My, my body's flowing. My, my mouth is flowing. Yeah. And my mind is flowing. I'm just, my body's all, I'm fantastic. And then we get to the other guy's house, and I walk into the room, and the other three guys are already there, and I'm like, I'm in this completely just open heart. I can't wait to see these blokes. I walk into the room, and I'm like, holy shit, I need to go to the toilet. And I feel like I'm going to piss myself. So I go to the toilet, and I'm like, fuck, my bum squeezed on. I need to have a piss. I'm like, this is bizarre. So I have a piss, and then I'm a bit more relaxed. I'm like, oh, wow, that was weird. So then I go to walk back out of the room. And I'm like, oh, cool. So I go back out of the room. I get halfway to the room. I see now the five guys sitting there. I need to do the dishes. You know, oh, it gives me something to do. I don't. Have... So I'm going. I don't know. I'm. Just... And then at that point, I'm like, I am freaking, freaking out here. I am as anxious as shit. Now, the reason I say that is for 35 years, I had no idea. Yeah. And then once I realised that my body was, my bum was squeezing on and off, I still had no idea and no story. Had no emotion. I just had my body response. And then as my physiology was relaxing and unwinding and getting a bit more resilient, a bit more capacity, a bit more sensitive, a bit more sensitive. I'm going, holy shit! I've got all this anxiety. Now, and so, and the beautiful thing there is instead of going, oh, this is bad, well, what do I do? Well, I just keep doing what I'm doing. I let my body tremor. I live my life. My body starts to relax. I notice that it's not coming on as often. I'm more connected to it when it feels on. I'm like, wow, I'm feeling anxious. Oh, my heart rate. Oh, my face is tense. So there's this process of unwinding starts to happen. And, and you know, so I'm like, wow, I've got this social anxiety that I never knew I had. Now, I look back and say, oh, I didn't like parties. I didn't like socializing, but I never felt why I didn't like it, I just, that was, mm. I just don't like it. So anyway, I keep doing that. So after about six months, my bum stopped. I mean, it would still come on and we never lose it. When I'm stressed, my bum might squeeze on, but it wasn't just habitually on all the time. And then there'd be situations where I was in a social setting and like my bum wasn't on. It's like, wow, this is fascinating. So of course, then what happens when my bum stops squeezing on, the next thing I'm like, oh my God, I've been squeezing my guts in for 40 years. So as that layer dropped away, I was like, oh my God, my guts. There's another layer. Oh my God, I've been squeezing my guts. Why well, I've never noticed this. And then that was like another few months as I keep tremoring my body unwinds. And then after that, my guts, now I could let my guts hang out again. And it's like, fuck, I can't breathe. 
my breath, I can't hold my breath. So there's this ongoing process where my physiology was starting to unwind. Layer by layer. Layer by layer. Beautifully determined. And David Berselli's got this great quote. We heal at the rate of the body, not at the rate of the ego. So when I lie down, I let my body unwind those tension patterns. It's not my ego saying I've got to make my shoulders relax or that. My body does it. Mm. If it was a conscious choice, I'd just choose to relax and let it all go, but I can't. Mm. So I'm starting to watch this progression of my body, the wisdom of it. Unwinding different layers. Unwinding. Now, the wisdom of my body winding up to keep me safe and protected, and then the wisdom of my body determining the rate of my unwinding and my healing and growth. So I don't open up too much and lose the plot, so I don't get overwhelmed. Mm. Long story short, so then I started to become aware of, um, you know, social setting you know anxiety and i was like what happened you know what was you know we've got to have this got to have the story two two fascinating things one was at a workshop with david berselli one day and i was lying on the floor tremoring and i said david i'm going to try and dissociate and like just let go and you know go in an altered state and let that happen he's like yeah cool and i'm lying there and as my body got more and more and more and more relaxed because I became really aware it was like faces, you know, people's faces, looking at someone's face, was, which should be the most calming thing in our lives, was triggering for me. So as I was going into that subliminal, half-awake, half-asleep state, this deep relaxation of my body is just melting and melting and melting. Then all of a sudden, bang, there's a face in front of my face. This guy's face. So, you know, I, I, and, you know, I, I don't claim to say things. I'll say, this is what I experienced. There was a face in front of me, like a vision of a face. And in that moment, I sort of had this thing of going, holy shit. Or as a child, there was this thing. I'm, I'm seeing something. I'm seeing someone's face. What do my parents tell me? There's no one there. Of course not. We're scientists. We're, we're Christians. We're, there's, no, there's no spirits. There's no whatever. Mm. Now, whether there's spirits or not, I don't care. All I'm saying is I'm having the experience of a face in front of my face, and it freaked me out. Like, I'm like, fuck! And I've just, you know, jolted awake. So I was like, oh, wow, there's more to this story than the idea of someone did something in my face. Mm. What's really, so, you know, so then I was like, right, I've got no idea, who knows what was going on, but this sense of, wow, that maybe the faces that I was scared of weren't human faces, or they weren't human physical faces, that there was something else going on as, you know, that had no context and no, no story. Mm. Now, that's great, and it gets all spiritual, and what I like to do is always to keep bringing it back to the body, because one of my other Bowen teachers... Um, Anne Schubert, this is called the Grandma of Bowen. Mm. And she works with a trauma informed model of Bowen. And one thing you'll remember she said one day is she's like, going, you know, people have all these stories about their past lives and all this stuff. She says, but I always reckon it's tied to something in this lifetime, an actual real physical, physical thing. So I became really aware of a pattern of going into groups, getting triggered. Sometimes I'd like get overwhelmed, scared, withdrawn. Other times I'd get hyper excited, inflated, bit manic, you know, out of the body. Mm-hmm. Even again, so that that men's <laughs> gathering that I talked about, so Menergy, so I was on the committee for three years. It's like the happiest time in my life. And yet going to that event one day, I remember about the third or fourth year, I went there, and I wasn't on the committee, so I didn't have a role to play. And I went there, and after I said hello to about ten blokes, I had to go to my room and lie down. I was almost crying. It's like, this is bizarre. I'm so freaking mm. out. I'm scared of going into this setting. And I became really aware of that pattern of this triggering of going into the social, going into a social setting was just like scary. Mm. Didn't make any sense. Long story short, I used to always say, so a big traumatic thing that happened for me is when I went to boarding school, my brothers had all gone. So I was super confident, wanted to go. I wanted to get out of the country to, to you know, the town. This was like, this was my destiny. And I look back and I go, it was a bit of arrogance and ignorance and all that sort of in a young child. But one thing that happened was very early on, and in the boarding house, it was like Lord of the Flies. Mm-hmm. It was just dog eat dog. And whatever was your most sensitive, um, insecure part of your life, that became your nickname. Yeah. And so I look back and, and when we're in year nine, so we had, there were those of us who were very young and hadn't been through puberty in with year nines and tens who were very old and had gone through you know, so we had, if you didn't have pubic hair yet, you could get called a skinner because you didn't have any pubes. Yeah. And I'll never forget, so, well, I did forget part of it. But so one day early on, I went into the boarding house um, TV room and all my whole entire peer group were there, these guys, year 10s, year 9s. And there was a seat next to one of the really cool, you know, leaders of the pack, the year 10 guy. So I just went and sat next to him because that was the only seat. And then we're watching TV, everyone's quiet. And then there was an ad on TV and he turns to me and goes, how you going, Stumpy? And the whole room erupted in laughter. 
I, all I knew was something was, I didn't know what was happening. The next thing I remember, and I have a complete gap in my memory, was I was standing outside the boarding house in the hall, and all I can remember is just being in shock and going, I don't know what's just happened. And then over a bit of time, I go, oh, okay, he was calling me stumpy because I'm you know, prepubescent, because so, you know, you've got this little dick. And because you're little, so that's, that becomes the thing. But in that setting, my whole peer group, mm. just like complete shame and humiliation. And, um, you know, my whole sense of ego and identity and bang, in that moment, shattered. Now, it wasn't until I started doing TRE, like I didn't happen to go back to my boarding school for 30 years or 25 years. And I look back and what I know now about stress and trauma is I then lived for four years in a state of chronic hypervigilance, 24 hours a day. Mm. I didn't. I didn't engage in the banter with other guys because if they called me stumpy, I'd be just like, right, I've just been beat. I've got the, you know, I, I saw myself as the as the runt of the litter. Like if I said, oh, you've got pus face because you've got, um, you know, pimples, or even I said, oh, you've got a banana dick because your dick's bent, they just go, oh, I'll get grow a dick, stumpy. So I was like, right, I've just been, you know, I've, I've just been slapped down on the runt. Yeah. So what it meant was I and and what I spoke to one of my friends recently said the behaviour we learnt was keep your head low, don't engage with people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so every time you walk into a room, and this happens still, every time people walk into a room, what happens? Everyone, you're on edge because someone's going to say something. Someone's going to drop you. So I started to get this sense of, oh, my God, this pattern was around every time I walk into a room of people, there's a chance that someone's going to publicly humiliate you and shatter your ego. Mm -hmm. And so that's, oh, wow, this is a pattern. Now, what I've learned from this was normally you'd say, oh, okay, that's terrible, that's trauma. And what I always like to frame people say, this wasn't the start of my stress and trauma. I was already a highly sensitive, highly anxious child. This was just something that brought it forwards. And, you know, what we'd say is, oh, we've got to make sure this never happens to anyone else. Whereas now I look back mm. and over the you know last 15 years or 10 years of doing tremoring, I'm like, my God, look at what this has taught me. Look at this has given me more humility, which I'm learning. And I think, my God, if that hadn't happened to me, I would have been the most arrogant, ignorant asshole in the world. Mm. And um, it's taken me on this journey of, you know, learning and healing and growth and understanding. And it's only been in the last few months where I, I'm sort of um, owning. I go, you know what? I've lived with PTSD for the last 25 years. I never called it that. I just said yes. I was stressed. And, you know, you go, well, I wasn't under any life and death threat. But to my ego and my identity, that was the ultimate that was the ultimate death. I've gone into this this community and it's just completely shattered. So living in that state of permanent hypervigilance. And I remember going back to the school reunion when we were about 25, 25 year reunion, first time I'd been back, walking around the school and everywhere I walked was like memories. Yeah. And the only place that wasn't like that, I happened to be, I was lucky that I was good at sport, mm -hmm. I was captain of the cricket. And so what that meant is people didn't pick on me all the time yes. because I had a level of, yeah. status and I remember walking down to the oval and it's like this was my sanctuary when I was yeah. captain of the cricket I was in control I was the you top dog that, right? no one could do anything well the funny thing was I was a wicket keeper <laughs> very funny right <laughs> yeah so there's this sense of that was a little that was a little sanctuary yeah and there's a great story my partner and, and I kind of got this my partner once said to me she heard Wayne Carey the AFL footballer talking about when his life was unraveling he said Playing footy was my sanctuary. I was brilliant at it. I was in control. Yeah. I was in peace. Once I went off the field, life was a nightmare. So that was like what it was for me through through the years. Now, what's been really recent for me over the last few months, so because I've always been a very self-observant um, person, so I've been really aware of that journey of you know what that did, what impact that had on my life, the healing, the growth, and it was kind of became a really positive thing. But in the last few months... It's only really started to drop into me the impact of how I've lived has had on people that I love. Primarily my eldest daughter, so I have that triggered response and hyper reactive, you know, hyper ang and all that anger. And the big one that showed it up to me was my dog. So we got a dog, which I always had dogs growing up. It was like I related more to animals than, than people. But when my dog was young and the pup, when it wouldn't do what it said, you know, when I called it and it wouldn't come, the level of intense rage mm. and fury that was inside me. So I've started to become, you know, I had a lot of, initially a lot of grief and sorrow about what I went through. But then with TRS, like, gee, this has made me who I am. I'm okay with it. 
But now I'm a little bit more going, oh my God, but this has been having this negative, quote, negative impact on my kid, mm. my dog, and starting to feel the grief, you know, in that, in that next layer as well. But also going, you know what? It looks bad. It is bad. It is painful. But there's going to be growth and healing um, from that as well. Mm. And so I suppose that's the, again, it's part of this whole story in the same way that we relax and surrender into the body. There's a sense of relaxing and surrendering to life. Life hurts. Sometimes it doesn't hurt. But getting anchored into the rhythm, the, the underlying, you know, just that I'm alive. This is happening. Um, and noticing the impact that, well, I've lost my train of thought here. Lotus, no, I've obviously got stressed about something or hide about something. Um, <laughs> anyway, so off the press. So, well, okay. So what's so so? I'm, it's like I'm getting much more aware of the impact of my reactivity. Now, it's mm. not me. I'm not choosing to it. Every day, I'm like, I want to be the best loving father I can. And for years, I would build, beat myself up. I'm guilty. I'm a bad father. I'm, you know, I'm not. Wasn't, am I choosing to do that? No. I still keep trying to do it, but my nervous system is reactive. I mean, it's like, is my daughter hyper-reactive because she's anxious? No, is she choosing? It's got nothing to do with her, but I would still habitually, oh, you're doing this, you need to do that, rather than go, wow, look at your organism is doing that. What can I do to help? Mm. So there's this process of healing and growth in my, my own journey. The thing that was hot off the press, though, this was, so, I used, so that was my story. When I was talking to my mate the other day who was at boarding school, and he had a similar kind of experience where he just said, look, I just learned to pull my head in and not engage. And he made this fascinating point, and, we, and we, talk, we were talking about the stuff that went on in boarding school, and we were really lucky, like, we didn't get sexually abused, like, I had two brothers that had a level of sexual abuse, horrendous things that happened to people. So on that level, I go, look, mine was, mine was nothing. To my, for myself, it then was everything. But, and he talked about it, and he made this point, which I never thought about. He said, you know, I said, well, you know, it was just the way it was back then. Yes, the boys run around, you have a couple of priests keeping an eye on you, but basically it's Lord of the Flies, you're on your own. Group of young males, great. That's going to work really well for everyone. <laughs> if you're in the top half of the hierarchy, it works great. If you're in the bottom half, it's a nightmare. And the amount of, like, we would call it, we called it ragging, but the amount of bullying that went on and the, you know, the picking yep. on people. And that's one of my great regrets is when I was in year 10, even though I didn't do any of that banner, I remember a kid that I then picked on who was most probably like me, sensitive, young, yep. bit underdeveloped. You know, I looked, so I just passed it on like people do with sexual abuse. You yep. just pass it on. But my friend made the comment and he said, so this is the hot off the press thing that I'd never realized this layer for me before. And I was saying, look, it's just the way it was. And he says, you know what, I don't really, I reckon they could have done stuff. It could have been better. It should have been better in a way. And he says, even back then in the 1980s or whatever, were there any girls boarding schools where you would have open shower cubicles? It's like, and we just talk, this. no. So when we're in year 9, 10 and year 11, 12, you just had, you know, like the old yep. sports room. Open. Now, would would you ever send a 13-year-old girl into a room with other girls and go, you're just all going to shower naked inside? In, we would never do that. Back then, we would never do that. But boys, it was just like, you all have to come into the shower naked. So it was only through, I had this amazing dream last night, wasn't necessarily related, but woke up crying, which is like this beautiful crying thing. And then I had the recognition, because he'd been talking about it, going, my God, every year for four years, Every time I got up in the morning and I had to sleep, I had to go into the showers, I had to get nude. And if I walked into the showers and there was no one in there, oh, I could have a shower. When I walked into the showers and there was anyone else in there, I was already freaking out. Yeah. So it's starting to get this sense of, wow, here's the kind of story, and I don't want to get lost in the, in the story right. of it, but part of it is going, this is the relevant, you know, this is relevant, this is a real thing, this is what happens, and it's led to those habitual um, patterns. So... The reason I share that is there's great, uh, you know, gratitude for the experience and the growth and the learning, but there's also, I'd say for a long time, I haven't actually embodied the grief and the real pain and the mm. suffering. And sometimes we get lost in that without being able to, to move and move and grow. So I don't know what, anyway, so mm. that's kind of, the, you know, so all of a sudden there's this another layer of like, wow. And, and again, that's great for my ego and my intellect to go, wow, I've just got that level of understanding. But when I tell that story, more importantly, is when I, when I drop into my body, it's like, oh, I feel that, you know, that heaviness and that grief and that sadness and the, my lungs start to let go and relax. My gut starts to drop out a bit more. And I go, my God, that's, I've been carrying that pattern around for 35, you know, well, I don't know, 30, yeah. you know, 30 something years. 
as a pattern. And now my body's like, oh, I can let that let that start to to grow. So it's not that it's not that bad things won't happen. It's not that we won't have stress and trauma. This is David one of David Baselli's great gifts to the world. Is this sense of you know trauma, stress, and I would say pleasure and everything. They're all evolutionary growth things if we can just go into them and allow them and allow them to you know heal and, and that's easy to say when yeah. everything's going well it's a nightmare when you're in the depth of it but yeah. there is this sense of for me of the, the whole you know life is growing me up and um that's the thing that i, I love the most i am life is growing you up I, and i'm getting more you know i've got so far to go but i'm so far further along than where i was 10 years yes. ago and i read somewhere the other day where so I don't know, someone in a book and they said, you know, only about five or 10% of people get into that growth state where they keep getting wiser and growing as they go. And a lot of us, you know, we just do the do, you buy the house, you get the job, you do that, you disconnect, you mm. function, you, you, you know, you provide for your family so your bloody family can do the same thing rather than, you know, really coming alive. And that's part of what I love about the tremoring process. It's also, you know, another great parallel is animals go through this process when they come out of hibernation. Yes. And it wakes them up and it brings them back to life. And that's what the shaking and tremoring does. And in a way, that's the why for me. It's like, yes, yeah, mm. so what if you heal your trauma? So what if I get over that story? That doesn't mean I'm living my life and I'm more expressive or I'm more authentic or my voice is deeper or I've got more uh, emotional expression or I've got more capacity to stay kind and loving rather than triggered in relation to my partner. Um, it's bring if people who do this, like I see this in my own life, I see this in anyone who keeps going with this process. It's like watching, how do you make a five-year-old become a six-year-old? You don't. You don't do anything. It just happens. Yeah. And as people keep using this, it's like you just watch it. It's like watching a flower unfurl. You don't have to do it. It's like the story about you don't have to pull the cocoon off the butterfly. You've got to let it struggle through. Yes. So there's this process. As I watch this mechanism both in myself, in the people who learn Terry, and globally, all the pe- this is, seems to be this impulse this organic innate impulse in the body which is healing and growing us and more importantly rather than just oh we're recovering from trauma is bringing us alive yes. and bringing us alive is bringing us back into our body yeah. and this sense of the life force and vitality and the energy and so a lot of people use tremoring for creativity and authenticity mm. and that's kind of what um, you know, brings me alive is god this is bringing me alive I want to share that with other people. And it doesn't have to be tremoring. It's like, I don't really, you know, this is one one way. And it's it's different from any other way I've seen mm. because most of our other techniques are conscious and driven by our ego. And this is something where the, it's like our organisms want to come alive. And in the again, in the neuroscientific, we just go, oh, well, it's the nervous system wanting to, you know, nervous systems want to reorganize. They want to let go of tension. They want to function better. Religious senses go, oh, you know, people want to get closer to God or they want to get mm. more connected to them themselves but the beauty of it and this comes back to your original question about this is probably the big learning for me is most of us and especially in western culture we tend to go up and out spiritual it's all up there it's all outside and i was very blessed to have a lot of contact with indigenous people which was the opposite direction we don't go up and out we go down into the ground yeah and so part of the thing around tre is going we keep going back into the body Mm. we're back into the body keep working with the body um, because it's got this amazing, it's got all the stories, it's got all this amazing capacity to heal and grow. And for me, and as we say, when we do that, when we get out of the way, the body wants us to be as happy and alive and connected and authentic and free and creative as, as we possibly can be. What does the next three to five years look like for you? So that's a, a good <clears throat> question. Um, I have to say, I'm just like, a <laughs> Well, yeah, more. One of the great things is the more I do, the more I, I sort of let go. I'll have a vision of what I think it should be. But it's like with tremoring. It's like you just ask the body and then you let it do, so let go of the vision. So, you know, what I would love to see is I'd love to see that this tremor mechanism reflex or whatever becomes totally mainstream. You know, if I was going to go pie in the sky, ultimate dream, it would be that every student in Australia and the world had some education about this, even from just a neurological perspective. So yeah. it's normalised, not pathologised. So there's no stigma <clears throat> and it's seen as this ultimate self-healing thing. Part of your everyday housekeeping. It's just, it's somatic hygiene. Brush your teeth, shake your body. No brainer. End okay. of story. It just becomes normal. So I'd love to think that it was in every education centre. I'd love to think it was in every emergency service. It was in the military. It was, but it just became as normal as brushing our teeth. 
in the wet. That's kind of the, the dream and the vision. And I will just keep doing everything I can to bring that about, but also with the knowledge of going, it's not up to me. In the same way that tremors arise wherever they do in the body, they pop up here and there. Yeah. And, and you know, when so I'm trying, to, I'm trying to create the conditions as much. When someone's ready to tremor, then they'll tremor. That's right. And when the world's ready to tremor, it's tremoring and it's happening. And, and I, you know, the key thing for me, I didn't, didn't mention this before, is this is like a revolution in our Western world. Traditional cultures have been doing it for thousands of years. The Kalahari Bushmen, the guys in the film The Gods Must Be Crazy, part of their key cultural identity is they call themselves the keepers of the shake. <laughs> the ancient samurai used a process called Seiki Jutsu, effectively life force yoga, where they would meditate, take their conscious mind away so their body would start to move and unwind. It allowed them, it was part of their secret, along with all the training they did, to be lethal warriors one moment and chilled out Zen masters the next. Mm. In our culture, we teach our warriors, emergency services, we <clears> teach <throat> them how to harder up, harden up. Yeah. Physically, it's not a metaphor. Physically, they harden up. We don't teach them how to soften down. Yeah. Um, the the uh, Swahili, Swahili, traditional Swahili midwives, in their culture, and David Bursella is telling, teaching a, a workshop um, where he sort of learned this story. So they, they traditionally giving birth, standing up, midwife holding under each arm. And then they say this, we will not let that woman lie down after giving birth until her convulsions have come to a complete stop, even if it takes half an hour. Because they've observed it and watched it, not because there's some intellectual, double-blind, random-controlled 44 studies that's been approved by the APS or whoever else. Because again, we've just watched it. Peter Levine, who developed somatic experiencing, which is a much more therapeutic approach to, to trauma recovery, his first introduction was with African gamekeepers who said, when we tag and release an animal, when we let it mm. out of the cage, if it shakes, it lives. When it doesn't shake, it dies. Now, in our Western medical, medical models say, well, okay, those midwives, those African gamekeepers, who are they? They don't have any study, they don't have any degrees, they don't have any research, we can't believe that, we need to do some study. They're just going, this is just how it is. Just We've been watching this for thousands of years. Mm. So, you know, I like to make that point. And, and, and again, even in our Western model, I can say, we've all been tremoring in utero forever. Every time you get shocked, your body shakes. It's, it's just that we've been misunderstanding it, locking it down. And part of what I love doing is, in my job, I'm not really doing anything about telling people what's already there. You know, so I'm not saying, oh, here's this new technique, do this. I'm saying, this is already inside you. First of all, stop pathologizing it. It's not wrong. It's not bad. It's healthy. This is how you let it happen. Now go away and do it. You don't have to come and pay me all the time. If you want to see me because you want help with it, great. But there's mm. lots of, and if something comes up and you're like, oh my god, we've got billions of great therapists on the planet. You can go and talk to yeah, them and yeah, do yeah. all that stuff. It's not about negating any of that. No. And it doesn't matter whether you believe in Buddha or Allah or Jesus or neuroscience or chi or prana or kundalini. The body doesn't get. The body's just doing the same thing all around the planet. And that's David Berselli's big gift was recognizing that this is something beyond culture, beyond yeah. religion, beyond spirituality. Mm. It's just this thing in the human organism. <clears throat> so, you know, I'm very, very blessed to have the opportunity to just basically turn up and go, "Hey, guys, do this. Look at this. Here it is. See what happens. Are you okay? If you're not okay, come and see me, and we'll help you get okay with it. Is it working? And if it's not working, look closer because it is working. Because mm. we can see it. Part of the reason people stop tremoring is when we're frozen and numb and disconnected from the body, our ego says, oh, no, I'm still a bit anxious, it's not working. Whereas when you measure, look at it in the physiology of the body, you measure heart rate variability or sleep quality, or we just look at people's muscular system, I don't need to do research to see whether it's working. I can see that in my eyes. My physio training teaches me to go, here's the muscular system, here's the muscular system, wow, it's more relaxed, it's working. Whether yeah. you think it's working or not, I mean, I want you to know it's working, I can see that it's working. We don't need the, and we need the research to keep the Western ego medical model happy, but just enough to say, hey, let's mm. let's do it. So I'm very, very, very blessed, and um, it's a lot of lot of fun, and and to see people come alive, you know, see people get find that empowerment inside themselves. Wow, I can do this simply lying in bed at night. Mm. Don't have to think about it, and, and, <clears throat> and it's like it's just like getting on the roller coaster of life and instead of it being terrified you're like shit this is fun this is amazing and it's it's just taking you and it's you know highs and lows ups and downs and at the end of it you feel exhilarated and alive one of the last questions i always ask my guests is <clears throat> if you could take a piece of a nugget of information and just upload it into the collective consciousness so everybody yeah. gets it yeah what would it be shaking is good for you when your body <laughs> shakes let it happen let go let go, let your body lead you, follow your body, surrender, 
surrender, just surrender, surrender, surrender. Let go. Let it shake. Let your body shake you back to life. That's probably it. It's been freaking awesome talking to you today. Like I what? could go on for another hour and a half, but I know you've got a plane to catch. No, there. no. And look, and for me too, I'm really appreciative yeah. um, of the opportunity to, you know, this part of his opportunities to share this yeah. is, I mean, it's just, it's a blessing and I love it. It brings me alive and um, yeah, it's, it's great. So thank you very much. I haven't, I haven't really had a chance to hear anything about your journey much or that, but the well, that'll come the out podcast. another day. Yeah. So thank you. Um, if anybody wants to find you or find Tremoring yep. here in Western Australia, where do they do that? So if, you, the, if you're looking for it in Australia, the website is treaustralia.com.au. If you're overseas, if you look up the global website, that's traumaprevention.com. And in Western, in Perth specifically, I think there are four, I think, TRE providers. Um, and two, two or three of those you can find through the TRE Australia website. So if you're interested in learning it, what I would recommend is go onto the TRE Australia website, look under find a provider, get in touch with whoever you know works well for you, contact those guys. Um, they're a bit like me. They're just waiting for the opportunities to teach yeah. people. So if there's a lot of people, contact them. They will put stuff on. They will run classes. They might do like a four-week class or you can do individual sessions if you need. And mm. if there's the demand, I will come back. You know, I'll just go wherever there's the demand. So if there's that, that's the way to find out about it. You can learn it on an app or through a pamphlet or through mm. a book. But I generally, I mean, if, you, if that's going to work for you, go for it and do it. But I generally recommend you're probably going to want that support to have because when you first hit your first bit of anxiety or tension or a bit of pain, you're like, oh, no, it doesn't make sense. So just having someone who said, no, no, it's okay, try this, work with it a bit differently that way. But if you do it and it happens or if you find yourself spontaneously shaking and you're okay with it and it's not freaking you out, just let Go it happen. It. You're already shaking already. That's, you know, that's it. But if you do do it or you're experiencing it and it doesn't make sense, then just get help from someone. Go and, go and find them. So that's Australia in Australia.com.au in Australia or traumaprevention.com. Um, that links you up with global the global TRE movement, which is in about 64 or 5 countries um, and growing. Awesome. Thank you yeah. so much for your time today. You're very welcome. Thank you. I hope you haven't spoken too much. <laughs> That's the point. <laughs>